to his disciples near the end of his earthly ministry in John 15. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. Instead, I have called you friends. Today, as you've come to worship, maybe you had been preparing to worship God, uh, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you also... Have you also come prepared to worship and to give thanks to your friend, Jesus? He calls us friends. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you, Tim and Doris. Welcome to Zion Church. Good to see you all here. A few things I'll share with you as we begin. Uh, Please sign the friendship folder, pass it along as I'm making these few announcements. First of all, this week, um, actually not this week, it's been moved. Uh, The Zion Ladies Ministry will have a meeting, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday. Tuesday the 27th at one o'clock p.m. All ladies of the church are encouraged to come, and uh, they will be discussing some upcoming events, including the Salad Tasters Luncheon, which will be in September. It will be on September 17th. 
and they will also be meeting. Um, are you, is the cutting up the noodles still going on? That's going Thursday, Thursday at 9 a.m. upstairs. Okay, so if you like to cut noodles, is that right? All right, if you like to cut noodles, Thursday at 9 a.m. upstairs in the upper room. Is that good enough? Okay, all right. Uh, and, and all ladies are invited to do that too. You don't have to have any previous noodle cutting experience. They'll teach you how to cut noodles. Um, a 50th wedding anniversary is happening today, and uh, Dave and Kathy McCamey and their family would like to invite the church to the Fellowship Hall from 1 to 3 this afternoon uh, to uh, congratulate them and take part in that. that. Light, light refreshments and cake will celebrate uh, this milestone with them. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board out in the narthex for Wednesday night dinners. If you enjoy cooking and would like to lead a team to cook for one Wednesday, please sign up. There are a few more dates in October and December that are empty uh, that we're trying to get filled. But we're doing pretty good. Uh, and thank you to all who have volunteered to cook for the Wednesday night dinners. Those will begin. Um, I don't remember the date, but it's the Wednesday after Labor Day, so two days after Labor Day, whatever that date is. I think it's the 10th or something, 11th. So, Any other announcements? It's the 11th. It's the 11th. It's the 11th. That's because the concert's the 12th. The concert's the 12th, right? Jesus is going to be here on the 12th, so there are sleepers in the church house There, there it is. Wednesday, uh, Thursday, September 12th, Ryan Stevenson, right here at Zion Church. Any other announcements? I'm going to be leaving at the conclusion of worship, um, so I'm probably, probably maybe right after my sermon or as we sing, I don't want you to be alarmed. I'm, some of you remember Bob and Joyce Bardeen who came to be with us about... Um, it was in April of last year, so a little over a year ago. Joyce passed away this past Thursday, so I'm flying to Kansas City this afternoon uh, to be with Bob and the family and to participate in services on Wednesday. So appreciate your prayers for Bob and appreciate your prayers for me as I travel. But uh, I will be leaving uh, be at the conclusion of worship, maybe before worship ends. So. And I, I will, I'll be out of the office. I'll get back Thursday night. So I plan to be back in the office on Friday. Any other announcements? Let's take a moment to greet one another. Good morning. Please join me in our opening prayer. Bless us, Father God, with a sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our minds and spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now we join in prayer together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 77, 12 through 14. I will consider all your works 
and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is greater, what God is as great as our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Good morning. Would you please stand for our opening hymn? As for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. We will sing of your love forevermore. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Your word alone, a lamp to my feet. A light to my path as you're leading me. Your ways, O oh Lord, are higher than mine. And to you I lift my eyes. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will sing of your love forevermore. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Open up every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. Open up every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. Open up every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. Open up every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, we will sing of your love forevermore as for me and my house we will serve the lord serve the lord and as for me and my house we will serve the lord we will sing of your love forevermore as for me and my house we will serve the lord Serve the Lord. Open up every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. Give thanks to the Lord our God and King, His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. And for the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. And sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, his love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever, and sing praise, sing praise, and sing praise, sing. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, 
forever and forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever and forever Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you, and hope is stirring, and hearts are yearning for you. We long for you Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day In your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saved us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. sound of hearts returning to you we turn to you and in your kingdom broken lives are made new you make us new when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saved us. Worthy of all our praises And Hosanna Hosanna Come have your way among us Welcome you here, Lord Jesus And Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saved us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. Church, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, 
forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Father God and our Lord Jesus Christ, with gladness we present these offerings of our life and labor to you for the ministry of your church and your kingdom. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 35, verse 8. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. Today we will be studying Paul's uh, words to the Galatians in chapter 5, and verses 16 through 26. Before we read this portion of the letter, let me share that the, the tone is going to shift uh, dramatically uh, in comparison to um, everything we've really been reading this summer as we've continued in Galatians. Um, and even if you just compare it to where we were last week, you, you'll see, you'll, you might feel like, if you were here, you might feel like, man, that shift was, was sudden. It was like, we're going down this street, and all of a sudden, Paul just says, okay, I'm done going that way. And so there's going to be a dramatic shift. Uh, he's going to suddenly move away from the problems of the church. And if you think about it, that's been the, the, the bulk of what we've been talking about week after week, are the problems in the Galatian church, the problems that the Galatian Christians have been facing, what's been thrown upon them. And, and all of a sudden, Paul, it's almost like Paul said, okay, I've been talking about this to you this whole letter. I'm done talking about it. Let's talk about something else. Uh, he's going to move on from harping on the Judaizers and the circumcisers and the law-focused Jewish Christians. And he's now going to focus on the source, shape, and image of the Christian life. Let's pray as we prepare to read and hear from God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that shapes our identity. Thank you for your word that gives us hope in this life and beyond this earthly life. As your word is read and preached this day, send your Holy Spirit that we may know and understand your ongoing work in us and for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I considered the message of these 11 verses in the letter, the word that came to my mind was holiness. Now that might strike you as peculiar because nowhere in those 11 words does Paul use the word holiness. 
Nowhere does he use the word holy. But as I read it, I think what Paul is describing is in fact the holiness of a Christian's life. And the first thing he shows us is the way of holiness. And the way of holiness is a walk. Verse 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. None of us can stay exactly where we are in this life. There's never a time in which we arrive at holiness. Like, aha, I got here. I'm holy. I've... I'm, I'm, I'm a made person. I've made it. Now, life keeps changing. The world keeps changing. world keeps throwing stuff at us. We face different things each and every day. We don't stand still. The world doesn't stand still. Neither can we. We're either moving toward God or we're moving away from God. We're either walking with the Spirit, we're walking in the way of the Spirit, led by the Spirit toward God, or we're walking according to the flesh, and we're walking away from God. There's no in-between. So I say, with Paul, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Which leads me to a second thought, and that is the agent of holiness. And the agent of holiness is the Holy Spirit. That's why we call Mr. Spirit his first name, Holy. Because he, God's Spirit is holy. He is the agent of holiness. Holiness, like righteousness, is not something we attain by ourselves. We can't, we can't make ourselves holy any more than we can make ourselves righteous. To be holy is to be set apart for a special purpose or a special use. Anytime anything in God in the temple was set apart as holy, it was set apart for a holy use. It was no longer common. The same is true for us. We are set apart for a special use or a certain purpose, but the thing is, we don't set ourselves apart. The Holy Spirit does that for us. The Holy Spirit sets us apart as holy. We're set apart not for, so that we receive special holy privileges. No. We're set apart and made holy for holy purposes. God's holy purposes. It's not about us. It never is about us. It's about God. And it's about what God wants to use us for in this life, in this world. And the Holy Spirit, as the agent of holiness, comes in to our hearts, to our minds, to our consciousness. The Holy Spirit comes into us. We become a temple of the Holy Spirit. The, temple, the Holy Spirit resides in us. And as the Holy Spirit moves in, He cleans house. The Holy Spirit cleans house. He gets rid of all that filth. He gets rid of all that ugliness. He gets rid of all that darkness and he replaces it with God. He replaces all the garbage of our sins, and he replaces it with the holiness of God. And it's good that we have an agent of holiness in the Holy Spirit. It is so good, because... And this leads to my third thought. It's so good that we have the agent of Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit working in us because of the experience, the experience of holiness. And I want to warn you before we flip to the next thing, this experience of holiness might not be what you expect, okay? Because I, you might expect if you're holy, for the experience of holiness to be something completely different than what I'm going to tell you it is, according to Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Because the experience of holiness is conflict. The experience of holiness is conflict. See, did you expect that? But if you think about it, you'll agree with it. It makes perfect sense. Paul describes it right here 
in these verses we read today. The experience of holiness is conflict. Look at verse 17. Paul points out that the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Holiness is not an escape from the flesh. Holiness enters us into a battle with the flesh. A battle that we can finally win thanks to the Holy Spirit. But holiness enters us into that battle. Holiness does not make life simpler or easier. Holiness heightens and amplifies the conflict between sin and righteousness within us. It heightens it and amplifies that conflict like we've never known before. Think about it. Before the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, they don't live with an inner conflict. Well, you might say, oh, when I was a kid, I knew, you know, I, knew I shouldn't do that. But oftentimes, that was based on what mom and dad said, what the punishment or the consequences was, were what the punishment or consequences at school or for your sports or things like that. That's why you did or didn't do things. But the Holy Spirit comes in, and suddenly it's not because anyone's telling us not to. It's not because mom or dad or the law enforcement. It's because the Holy Spirit within us heightens and amplifies and tells us that the flesh is contrary to who you are. The flesh is in contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you, and then you feel that conflict like never before. And that's what Paul is saying here. Before the Holy Spirit came into your life, you didn't live a life of conflict. You lived a life of destruction. Sin is destruction. Sin is death. But before the Holy Spirit came to you, you were oftentimes content to live that way. Content to live in sin. Maybe not all the time, but now and then. Why? Because everyone dies anyways. But when you receive Jesus Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit who gave you faith, then you realize, no, I'm not going to die. Actually, I'm not going to die. I have life. I have eternal life in Jesus Christ and I'm going to live with God, and I want to live right now as God would want me to live. That is all the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's the experience of holiness. But now you live in conflict. Why? Because you're still a human being. And sin is still at work against you. The Holy Spirit is at work in you, but sin is at work against you. Satan and his demons are attacking you with temptation and sin. So what do you do? You walk in the Spirit. You walk by the Spirit. You allow the agent of holiness, the Holy Spirit, to continue to do His work in you. And you remember, you remember who you are now. You remember who you are now in Christ Jesus. You remember who you are now as a temple of the Holy Spirit. You remember who you are now with the agent of the Holy Spirit working in you. You are no longer that dead, ungodly sinner. That person is long gone. That is not who you are in Christ Jesus. Paul said in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There's a story told of, uh, of Martin Luther, and whether this story is a true story or if it's a, a fictional legend made up about Luther, I don't know. But it's, it's a good story, and it doesn't hurt using it as a story. Um, as long as I clarify, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's, it's an often told story of, of Luther. And it so happens... Um, that Luther was in his uh, study one night. And if you know anything about Luther, if you studied him, you, you know that Luther had an innate sense of the devil. He, he oftentimes could be heard shouting at the devil, having, having a shouting match with the devil. That's how much he felt the, the spiritual warfare. And he would just shout out at the devil and argue with him and fight him off with words. And on this occasion, 
Luther was in his study, uh, reading, writing, and he heard a knock. And then he heard the devil. It was the devil knocking. And the devil said, is Martin Luther there? And, and Luther takes his uh, bottle of ink that he was dipping his quill into, and he takes it and he throws it against the wall, and he shouts back at the devil, Martin Luther no longer lives. I am a new man in Christ now. It's like what Paul wrote back in Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The conflict between flesh and spirit is real. The conflict between sinfulness and holiness is real. Many of the specific sins mentioned by Paul here in Galatians 5 are life-altering and mind-controlling sins. It's not an exhaustive, uh, exhaustive list of sins, but he, he clearly wants to get at, talk about some really, really life-altering sins here. And some of these sins can never, well, no sin can be broken without the total redemption and cleansing found through the receiving forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And although Jesus Christ may deliver one person instantaneously and, and completely from one or more of those debilitating sins, some people do that. They receive Jesus Christ, and it, the, in the newfound freedom, they found that they're no longer tempted by any of those temptations or sins, or no longer tempted by their, their worst, uh, uh, most detestable sins anymore. But then God may allow another to rely on his grace day by day, hour by hour, to fight former temptations, maybe even throughout their whole life. A person may endure agony of the soul as they are delivered over a much longer period of time. Also, sometimes we're not delivered from all the effects of our formal, former sinful lifestyles. When someone uh, asked uh, Reverend Billy Graham what to do about previous divorces and remarriages, Billy Graham said, you can't unscramble eggs. As a, his practical way of saying that you must start anew in the Christian life, repairing and restoring where it's humanly possible, but then you have to trust the remainder to God's hands. God is not interested in our happiness. God is interested in our holiness. To be holy before God requires being completely surrendered to Him by allowing His Holy Spirit to take control in our lives. But God doesn't leave us to our own devices there either. The Holy Spirit brings into us the characteristics and the personality of God Himself. And that brings us to the result of holiness. And the result of holiness in us is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, fruit is singular, not plural. I think, and I could be wrong, but I think the most common misunderstanding of the fruit of the Spirit is that there are nine different and separate fruits, but that's not the case. It's one fruit, and the fruit has all those godly and Christ-like characteristics. The second most common misunderstanding, and it goes off of that first misunderstanding, so if you think that there's multiple fruits, there's nine different ones, then that leads to the second misunderstanding, and that is I think there are some Christians who think they don't have some of the fruits because of their personality or because of the weaknesses they experience in their human nature. But again, the fruit of the Spirit is singular, not plural. If you have the fruit of the Spirit, if you have the Spirit, then you have the fruit of the Spirit. And so if you have the fruit of the Spirit, then you have both love and patience. But you don't know me, Pastor. I'm not a patient person. I, can't, I don't like waiting for anything. If you have the Spirit then you have the fruit of the Spirit. You have love, and you have patience. 
if you, ha- you have faithfulness and you have joy. Well, again, pastor, you don't understand. I can be faithful to my husband. I love him very much. But my husband will tell you, I'm a grumpy person at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't have joy. We're, we need to go a little d- deeper with joy anyways because it's not how you feel at 7 a.m. before coffee anyways. But, but if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the fruit of the Spirit. You have faithfulness, yes, and you have joy. So why then does it seem like at times that there's four or five that come easier to me than the others if I have all these characteristics and personality traits of God? Why then are some seem easier than others? Why? Did you forget? We're in a conflict. It's a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Fits of rage are of the flesh. Self-control is fruit of the Spirit. I was just sharing with Jenna this week um, some embarrassing stories, and she's heard these stories before. Probably if she knew me when I was um, this way, she maybe wouldn't have ever dated me. I don't know. But, but I was sharing some stories, rehashing some stories um, about my temper uh, my fits of rage, let's just call it what it was, fits of rage when I was a child and a teenager. I had a tremendously dangerous temper. Now, it took a lot to get me mad. I had a very long fuse, but once that, and, and you could sometimes put that fuse out, but once it got to the point where, it, where the fuse was gone, it was explosion. And, and it would lead me, and I don't say this with any kind of, any, um, Pride, definitely not pride, but I don't say it joking around either. But my, my fits of rage would lead me to a point where I would break stuff. And I would tear stuff up. And I would over, sometimes over major things and sometimes over minor things. But I even wrecked a car on purpose one time in a fit of rage. Now, after Christ, I found that I had a newfound self-control what brought that into my life it wasn't my parents who finally figured out how to help me out it wasn't teachers or counselors or law enforcement thankfully i never had to run in with the law enforcement in my fits of rage it came from the agent of holiness i accepted christ into my heart by the power of the holy spirit the holy spirit regenerated my heart so i could receive jesus christ and the Holy Spirit moved in to stay. Now when something really upsets me, which is still hard to do, I still have a long fuse, but it's still possible that I get upset, I'm well aware of the temptation to blow up. I haven't forgotten my past. I remember my fits of rage. I haven't forgot the stupid acts that I committed. And I even might have some of those same feelings of the flesh that I had when I was a child or teenager. And it's not just mental. It's not just emotional, right? Uh, I mean, there's physical things that go along with it. I feel it. Things like my heart rate increases. For some reason, my ears feel warm. My blood pressure goes up. Uh, I, my, I, I have adrenaline that just wants to be released. So it's physical too. But what do I have now? What keeps me from doing what I did before Christ? The fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control. Who keeps me from fits of rage? Not me, myself, and I, and Jenna. But the Holy Spirit that is within me. The single fruit of the Spirit is quite dynamic. It has many dimensions to it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's as if this single fruit has multiple flavors. I'm reminded of the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory used to watch it when I was homesick from school. 
there was a there was a piece of candy on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory called the Everlasting Gobstopper. You remember that? And what was two things that were so fascinating about the Everlasting Gobstopper? One is that it never got smaller and it always existed. It, hence, never ending. The other amazing thing about the Everlasting Gobstopper was it had an endless variety of flavors. And on its own, it would change from one flavor to another as the person enjoyed that piece of candy. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is one specific item with several continuous qualities. The point here is that all these flavors of God's personality, all these flavors of God's characteristics is in the Christian. And the Holy Spirit works in us, bringing out of us those different qualities as we need them in our life. And the Spirit's work ties us to Jesus and leads us to see that we have true satisfaction, everlasting satisfaction in Christ alone. And then Paul says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Going back to what he said at the beginning, right? About it being a walk, walk by the Spirit. Well, here he says in the end, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. In other words, if we are alive by the Spirit, then it will show in our daily walk. We'll be walking in the Spirit, and it will show in our behaviors. It will show in our language. It will show in how we treat one another. It will show how we treat one another in our homes, and it will show in how we treat one another at school. It will show how we treat one another everywhere. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. John Calvin once wrote, The death of the flesh is the life of the Spirit. If God's Spirit lives in us, let Him govern all our actions. The death of the flesh is the life of the Spirit. This is holiness. This is the way of holiness the agent of holiness, the fruit of holiness. Holiness is the Holy Spirit living in us. Holiness is allowing the Holy Spirit to have control over us, to govern us. Holiness. Holiness. That's what we desire. Holiness. Holiness is what we need. And holiness is exactly what the Holy Spirit has given us. Will you pray with me? Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us strength to live out the holiness that we have heard of today. The holiness that is already within us by the presence of the Holy Spirit. To the glory of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. is what I long for Holiness is what I need Holiness Holiness is what you want from me Faithfulness Faithfulness is what I long for Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, 
faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. And take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. So do you oh, oh. They have an extra one on there. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind and transform it. Take my will, conform it into yours, into yours, O oh Lord. To yours, to yours, O oh Lord, to yours. This morning's benediction, please receive the morning's benediction. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Have a great week.